product placement. <sighs> Let's have a chat. All right, so Destiny 2, Curse of Osiris has finally been released, and I've... I uh, feel like I need to do a thoughts video, an impressions video on it, and uh, didn't feel like making a script, so I just have an outline. Diving right in. It's been about 24 hours or so, almost, almost. It's been about 20 hours since uh, the game is released, and uh, I played it for around 12 hours or so yesterday. Uh... Streamed it, had a fun time for the most part with uh, playing with Cheerio, playing with Seascoon, playing with my friends, because playing with my friends is fun. Uh, however, big hairy butt, the very large massive hairy butt to that statement, there's a lot of stuff wrong with Curse of Osiris, and I kind of want to delve into that in this video. First off, the biggest, biggest thing for me is the Eververse Trading Company. Uh, there, there's already been so much discussion on this, but for some reason this feels a little bit even, like, even more egregious than normal to me, because we're already in a situation in the game where we're kind of lacking incentives and rewards to go run a lot of the activities. Uh, and then we have Everest coming in, completely restocked with new stuff, exotic ghosts, which we haven't had yet in the game, you know... There, there's all this new stuff in there. Ornaments, ghosts, sparrows, ships, emotes. Basically, aside from the emotes and exotic weapon ornaments, everything in there used to be relegated to in-game activities or just some sort of incentive to play any of, the, any of the activities in the game. All this stuff is now relegated to a generic loot box. And... You know, we're, we're sitting here as players wanting to play the game, wanting to have reasons to go play the game. And part of that is because the like the rewards that you get at the end are just not really there. And in Destiny 1, all this stuff, you, you know, you, you would grind the raid to hopefully get the ghost. You would grind the raid to get the sparrow, the ship. You would go do other stuff to get, you know, ghosts. You would get... You would go play the game to get the stuff, and now you play the game, and then you might get a loot box, and it might have one of these things in it. It's just a really generic way to now have to focus a lot of our gameplay, and it's not fun. Uh, it, it, it takes away a lot of the interesting stories that we had as players where, hey, remember when, uh, remember when you got you know, your favorite exotic from Destiny 1? I guarantee you, you remember how you got your first Gallonhorn. I guarantee you remember when you got, you know, I don't know, No Land Beyond or whatever. You remember these moments. And you remember going for some of that other stuff, the raid sparrows, the ships. There's a lot of stuff that you remember getting. And now a lot, all these rewards, for the most part, are relegated to engrams. This is going beyond Eververse now, but just like the exotics and legendaries and stuff that you get, all of it is from an engram. When I got... The, uh, I, I got the new hunter pants that are really interesting. You know, when you, when you dodge, you get, you can like disorient enemies and stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I can't wait to use them in PVP, but I didn't get that from a quest. I didn't get that from a specific activity. I got that from doing a milestone and talking to Cade and he happened to give those to me and I, the only reason I remember that is because someone in chat said, you should probably remember this because, hey, it wasn't from an engram. And you know what? That person's right. That's about the most unique experience that I've had getting loot in the game. Moving back to Eververse. Um, you know, I'm just, just tired of seeing it. I'm just tired of seeing a lot of the stuff in the game moved more towards Eververse. You know, you better believe Eververse is restocked, but God, the, a lot of the problems in the game just... Those those are still there. Um, I should probably make a special note of this. I fully realize that game development is... It's not as we think, where they didn't start on Curse of Osiris once Destiny 2 was released and then started building all this stuff uh, with the feedback and stuff they were getting on Destiny 2. Curse, Curse of Osiris was being developed alongside Destiny 2. It was probably 
basically done, like 95%. Just had to get that golden brown crust built on it in the oven. Uh, You know, it, it was basically done by the time Destiny 2 had come out. Maybe for like the first two or three weeks that the game was out, they were still able to do a little bit of stuff, but massive reworks and changes to it, that wasn't a possibility in the spectrum of them actually releasing it in December. That's the harsh reality of game development is, you know, large sweeping changes, it's going to take a while. Um, But as a consumer and, you know, as, as a gamer, you don't really care about that. You, you don't have to have sympathy at, for that. You want the game that you like to play and the game that you want to play, you want when an update comes out, you want it to seem like an improvement, not a, you know, more getting getting another McDonald's hamburger when you just had a McDonald's hamburger, but you were really wanting to get one of those, I don't know, Name name your favorite fast food. You want you wanted In and Out or something. I don't know. Uh, whatever uh, burger joint that you really like. You wanted that, but you had to keep settling for McDonald's. That's what it feels like uh, for Curse of Osiris to me, kind of as a whole. If you like food analogies, uh, move it, moving on to actual Curse of Osiris stuff. Uh, the story itself is okay. I'm I wasn't incredibly blown away by it for any real reason like we we finally got to meet Osiris awesome oh we got to see him in a cutscene and another cutscene and he kind of joined us for the end boss fight uh by the way spoilers in this video there there will be spoilers in eight minutes and we got a spoiler warning um yeah so you know we heard about this mythical character and you know, we didn't really get to really see the whole hell of a lot of them, which was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, uh, overall, for the story, I I liked seeing Mercury and all of its different incarnations, the past, the present, the future. All of that stuff was really cool. Um, I wish we could delve more into it, though, instead of just kind of these really brief glimpses at cool, interesting uh, uh, gameplay ideas. The the high point for for this for me was probably just the overall art direction of the game again. Like th- this is it's the one universal constant of Destiny: the art direction, sound design, um, you know, stuff like that. The stuff, the way the the way stuff looks, the way stuff feels, uh, the way you are incorporated into the play space. All of that stuff is done so well. Like that's complete ten out of ten every time. Just, it, it has been. And the thing that we keep waiting for as players is the actual gameplay experience, be it from doing the activities, playing them, the investments, uh, you know, incentives to play, to play said activities. That stuff is what we're waiting on to actually get up to the level of this phenomenal art direction. That's what we're waiting on as players is, and it's like, is that a feasible goal? Well, I sure as shit hope so. Because, man, uh, it's going to be like, I don't know, art, art direction team. Maybe chill out for a little bit so we can finally, I don't know, uh, uh, chill out for a little bit so the other teams can you stop. You're making everyone else look bad. Uh, the Infinite Forest is something I also wanted to kind of get into here. So, first of all, the Infinite Forest isn't something that you can just access from the uh, story or from the patrol space on Mercury, it's something that you have to you have to get an adventure for. You can basically only access it once per day. Uh, we could access it multiple times uh, via the story, and I think there was like a bug on day one where we could just keep going in to said uh, story mission or said heroic things. But you can you can only access it like once, and I was really hoping it was going to be a repeatable, playable. Thing via something like Archon's Forge, Prison, or Prison of Elders, and it's something along those lines where you could keep going back into it, but it's not. And at the same time, I don't know if I would even want to go back into it multiple times, even if it was a repeatable thing, because the the act of going into the Infinite Forest, you have to go into these little sections that are pre-built that load up. I like that. It's it's cool. It's some pretty cool tech. Um, 
but as an actual playable thing as a player, it's not interesting at all. Uh, there's only two basic modes for those things that load in for, for the areas that load in either it's an area where you have to go in and kill some little, little demon glowing red creatures. Uh, and then you can progress to the next preloaded, uh, pre-made area, or you just have to get to the end of that thing and, you know, cause the next place to spawn. It got kind of comical during the story that one of our attempts or one of our you know, trips through the infinite forest to get to the end activity in it was we didn't have to kill a single thing except for the very end. We had to kill one Hydra type boss or mob that was like one shotable. That was it. Like we just ran to the end, caused the next area to spawn, ran to the end, caused the next area to spawn and didn't have to kill anything. And it's just, that's not a fun, interesting, it's, it's a rather boring way to get to another activity for all intents and purposes it's just a playable loading screen that you have to like set some parameters up before you can actually go play the activity now once you get to those end activities those actually those are again so close we say that so much with almost every activity in destiny 2 it's so close to being this really cool interesting thing data was talking about it earlier on twitter how the bug in the machine it, uh uh, activity the heroic adventure is so close to its own playable activity in and of itself and i really agree with them it's uh you end up going to like old mercury when it was kind of these you know lush foresty plain savanna type area and you have to stop some hive from getting in and it basically turned into almost almost this tower defense type area where you're having to hold back, you know, shoot some waves of enemies that were coming in. And then, you know, the enemies got harder as it went on. And oh, my God, if, if you just had more more people in there and like an endless wave thing that was coming in and had different objectives that you had to do that area right there, that would be an in-game activity that could be repeatable. Like it was actually fun to do that one specific instance. You know, I felt challenged overall. It was heroic. So I was also kind of under, I think I was under light for it. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, every time I died, I could never see the uh, light level of the stuff in there. But, you know, that felt really interesting. You, Bungie, you have something there. You keep keep pushing on that. Whatever that was, if we could get these Vex simulations, instead of having to do this loading screen, thing where you're you know killing the demons or whatever just you just load into that you load into that alternate reality or simulation and then now it turns into a horde mode something like you can you have something there uh i, I really liked that one if you can't tell uh moving on, i think i think that's about it for the infinite forest uh oh the infinite forest one last thing, like the act of the loading into the next area as i've been saying it like that is almost its own activity in and of itself. If you just, if each platform had its own separate objective and maybe the enemies got harder and you had to keep moving forward and there wasn't really an end, it was infinite as the title of the activity suggests, then you would have another kind of infinitely repeatable activity for the most part. As, yeah. So we there's a bunch of things about the infinite forest that are that are close. They're very close to being, you know, real tangible activities that I would like to have in the end game. As it stands right now, the only reason I'm playing them is for the forge weapons, which is what we're moving into now. Uh, so you got the first one, and uh, I gotta say, I, I'm I'm happy that we have some sort of like grind in the game that we have a we have an item. And we had to, I had to do 10 public events, essentially, to get this item. Or possibly one, if I got one of the uh, blue items instead of the green ones that were upgradable. Uh, I like that. I like that we can go grind. Uh, I feel that the grind is a little bit too heavy right now. Just a little bit. A little bit it's a little bit too much on, on the kind of RNG side. Because half of mine, I completed it. I completed it because a chest that I opened had one of the blue things I needed to turn in. And then the next public event I did gave me a blue one as well to kind of complete said item. And that was a little disappointing because in my fire team members, they had to grind 20 public events. They never got a blue quality one. Uh, so the RNG of that is 
a little bit suspect. I'd like maybe, I don't know, maybe if it was like every five or so that you did, you had a chance to get a blue one. Yeah. Just, just a little bit less on that grind. The only reason I'm not really happy with the, the way you get the forge weapons is it's doing activities in the game that we've already been doing for the past three months. And, you know, grinding public events yesterday, after I'd completed the story and we had to go do public events, someone came in chat and they're like, wait, are you playing the DLC? I'm like, yeah, we're playing the DLC. We're having to do public events on the European Dead Zone because that was the fastest way to do public events to get the materials that we needed. And, you know, I was hoping with the DLC we could maybe do more stuff related to the DLC, not the same stuff we've been doing for the past month uh, on PC in the past, you know, two and a half months on console. It's a little, little bit of a shame for me. The weapons themselves, I've only gotten the scout rifle from it, so I don't know how good they are, how interesting they are uh, to use. That being, uh, With that being said, the scout rifle that I got didn't exactly give me a lot of incentive to go grind the other uh, forge weapons because they were all for the most part a little bit uh, under or, or the scout rifle itself was underwhelming it's a slow rate of fire scout rifle which is kind of eh, and then it had a really high reload speed but then also had outlaw on it so I'm just kind of like well, why have outlaw when you already have like a mighty level reload speed on it anyway uh, I like there's a large investment time with the things cool um, moving on to the heroic playlist that was added. It's literally the old playlist, except it's light level two or power level 270 now. Uh, and I think you have to have said, or you have to have Curse of Osiris to actually run it. I'm not I'm saying this during the stream yesterday. We keep talking about, we need incentives to run things. Um, and I get that we want rewards and stuff to go get, but I want the incentive not necess I want I want us to have incentives to run things. Absolutely. I want I want us to get stuff. But I want incentives that the gameplay itself is going to be fun as well. And these strikes, while I like them thematically, mechanically, aside from the one that has the uh vandal that disappears, aside from that one, mechanically, I like them. They're interesting strikes. However, they're not fun. Gameplay wise, I was really hoping we'd see some sort of modifiers come in to maybe make me feel more powerful, which is another another thing with the sandbox as a whole where we don't really feel all that powerful in PVE. So hopefully these heroic strike playlists would maybe incentivize you to go run them so you could feel powerful. But I would rather feel powerful in general. Uh, yeah, heroic strike playlists. Uh, I don't think any amount of rewards, unless you're giving me exotics every time, which don't do that. Uh, increasing the amount of like coins and uh, tokens at the end of it was very nice to see. However, it's not enough to make me keep going back and run the uh, and run the heroic playlist. The only thing that is actually going to keep me running them right now is uh, the fact that doing. Uh, PvP is kind of a nightmare due to one of the exotics that came in. Uh, is kind of overpowered and broken in the way Vex Mythic class was broken. So hopefully we don't have to wait three months to see that fixed. Hopefully we don't have to see trials get canceled uh, for them to put in some sort of hot fix to fix that uh, that weapon that is very much broken. Yeah, that's that's kind of the situation that we're in right now. The only way I'm the only reason I'm going to go do the heroic playlist is because the other stuff in the game is not. Uh, not so friendly to someone playing right now. Uh, the, one of the big things for me, God, this is a long rant video. One of the biggest things for me right now is, uh, the prestige level activities, things that 24 hours ago I was able to do because I was light level 300. I had hit the max light level and that was the level for prestige. And now they raise the prestige level to 330. Okay. Okay. Prestige level has been raised to 330. So it's supposed to be like, you know, end game levels rewards. But what that ends up doing to me as a player is that just makes me feel weaker. And I'm having to work back up to a point to feel less weak again 
in the overall scheme of things. And not to mention that I had to pay $20 to feel weaker. Uh, that, that doesn't feel like you're respecting the player's time on, on that little, little bit right there. You know, I had, I was watching Funhouse do the, do attempt, uh, attempt the raid for the first time. And this was like last week and they had to stop because, you know, they, they can't play the raid for like 10 hours straight They They got lives and shit to do. Uh, uh, and now with this Curse of Osiris coming out, the base level of the raid got rate got raised up as well. And I'm just the first. My first thought was, oh my god, those peep funhouse, and then the people that had maybe just gotten up to the level of doing you know, the doing the raid was a feasible thing for them. Nope, you got to get up to 300 now to do the base level of the raid. Level of the raid. If you also like doing the prestige level of the raid, well, guess what? Now you have to go get Curse of Osiris. Remember that ornament that you got from uh doing you know the ornament that you had to get to go run the prestige level of the raid for for legend of accurate well now you have to pay twenty dollars to be able to get that ornament right right am i just kind of crazy here so that type of stuff needs to be reeled back on you can't do that you can't you can't do that <laughs> um you know having stuff that we previously had access to now we don't that's not going to fly anymore, uh, especially in Destiny 2's just overall sandbox reception, uh, the way that we do content. There's not enough of it there to really make us... Yeah. Um, so, speaking of sandbox, I think I think that was it. Everything about, the, uh, about me hating that we just got weaker, uh, paid $20 to effectively get weaker. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, moving over to the sandbox, uh, there's a lot of stuff that they updated there. I'm really happy to see, you know, change to Night Stalker will immediately suppress things. I was really disappointed to see Night Stalker super didn't kill someone on hit if they, you know, it's like, is that really so much to ask that it kills, it's a super, it should kill someone on hit. Um, and you only get one of it, like per match, basically. Yeah. You know, there are tons of stuff got changed. Uh, I think the change to pulse grenades was the right amount of change that needed to happen. It wasn't, you know, insanely nerf it into the ground type thing. They brought a ton of other grenades up in damage and PVE. Fantastic. That's basically what we asked for. Uh, we didn't want pulse grenades nerfed. Other stuff needed to come up as well. Awesome. Uh, you know, o- overall, I think some of the sandbox changes were really good, but at the same time, this is going to sound really like, oh my god, Bungie just can't win here. But it wasn't enough, really. <laughs> I fucking hate saying that. Um, because it's just, ah, it makes me sound like I'm whining all the time here. Uh, yeah, we, we're, at, we're at the stage now where, you know, they did a sandbox update and they touched on a bunch of stuff. Uh, we got high caliber rounds uh, weapon-wise, you know, got kind of reduced on scouts and auto rifles, which it's kind of been proven that it doesn't have that much of an effect, but still players didn't like it, so they reduced it. Great. Uh, precision auto rifles came down and their precision damage, base damage, though, went up. So good. It, you know, they, they were too strong in PvP, but this doesn't affect their damage output in PvE at all. I'm still going to use them because they feel good to use. Uh, you know, we, we got some, uh, hand cannons, got some much needed changes. Uh, you're not going to really notice it if you're using mouse and keyboard, but on controller felt, you know, felt a little bit better. Uh, unfortunately stuff that we really wanted to see change for overall in PVP, like, you know, in air accuracy that, that was kind of nerfed or that, that was, uh, re- reduced because, to kind of uh, lessen the skill gap between players, you know, stuff, stuff like that. I would have loved to see inner accuracy changes come in to have to allow these more powerful hero moments in PVP, where maybe you can outplay a bunch of players. If you're able to use verticality to your advantage, it's not really an option anymore. The only, the only thing in PVP that actually shows that you are a really good player right now is either your ability to stay really close to your teammates, which is boring as hell for solo players which i am for the most part it's boring as hell to have to play against it as a solo player it's boring if you play as a group like that um 
you know, however skill intensive it might be uh, for the competitive side of the game, that's not going to be there yet. There's no ranked and stuff like that. So, you know, having that aggressive of a team based meta right now with no real activity that promotes it aside from trials ah, is frustrating. Uh, I, I would have loved to see some sort of sniper rifle change, both for PvE and PvP. I feel like flinch overall is way too hard on sniper rifles. Um, you know, I don't want it to be to the point where, you know, you're just always, your scope is perfectly, you know, steady, no matter how much damage you're taking. No, that's stupid. But, you know, you, you take, you you take a thimble of damage or you happen to, you know, walk down a hill and your guardian is actually technically floating or in the air while they're walking down the hill and up your accuracy went to hell, stuff like that. Uh, I'd love to see sniper rifles improved in some capacity because right now, and that's my that's the power fantasy that I like. I I may be bad at it with mouse and keyboard, but I was really good at it with a controller because you know aim assist and whatnot. And I have no incentive to use that weapon class that I really like using because rocket launchers are just the best thing, straight up. They are just the best thing to use in PVE and PvP as your heavy weapon. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of telling. Uh, anything else from the sandbox that I didn't get into? I can't think of anything right now. Um, the final, uh, some some of the final stuff, I guess. Um, exotic wise, it, I sound tired right now because a it's like five a.m. Uh, B, I'm really tired of getting the like Destiny One exotics brought back up, and us getting them again, like. We, I remember in Destiny 1, when, when Taken King came out, it's like, oh, you're losing access to, to basically all this stuff. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. Oh, we're bringing back a lot of stuff. Oh, well, okay. Well, kind of sucks. Kind of already paid for it. Now we're like having to slowly gain access to it again. And then they kept happening where you're bringing back, st- bringing back stuff up. And then uh, when... You know, they announced that, hey, none of your stuff is carrying over. I was like, sweet, we got a full sandbox reset. Awesome. You know, they're going to be able to do, you know, so much more now that they don't have a lot of this stuff kind of, you know, uh, holding them down. And then we keep bringing Destiny 1 exotics back. (sighs) I've already paid for this stuff. I have already paid for that in Destiny 1. Multiple times, in fact. If we're, if we're, if we're, you know, being completely honest here, you know, I paid for it once in Destiny 1, then with Taken King, I paid for it again, then Rise of Iron, I paid for it again. Now in Destiny 2, I paid for it again to have the privilege to use Hard Light and Mida and all the other exotic armor. Sorry, my uh, uh, heat just kicked on. Um, and now Curse of Osiris comes out and I get to pay for the privilege again to get Jade Rabbit and Telesto. And I'm tired of seeing this stuff come back. Like... <laughs> you know, I get it. Players liked like that stuff. I liked using that stuff. I liked using it for almost three years. The only thing I am okay with coming back right now is Jade Rabbit. Because Xbox got fucked for two years not being able to use it. Just straight up. You know, they, they couldn't use it. So I am okay with Jade Rabbit coming back. But Telesto, the thing we used for two years, the... You know, all the armor pieces coming back, everything. I'm tired of seeing that. And, like, why? Uh, Do do we need more ideas on the developing side? You know, are are we we banking on, you know, the nostalgia of Destiny 1 players being a huge selling point for for them to make make them buy the expansion because hey remember that thing that you liked in Destiny One hey now it's coming back here in Destiny Two again if, as long as you buy this I'm I'm just I'm done with it man I'm tired of seeing that we have you have a wealth a plethora of ideas and knowledge that you can use to build new interesting exotics and and things for us to use as players and we keep revisiting the same things and then I have to pay for it ah sorry i've repeated myself a ton of times there ah anyway Uh, okay i think that's about it for this curse of osiris if you were uh, to round things out curse of osiris if you 
We're on the fence about buying this because a lot of the stuff that you were unhappy with in Destiny 2, you were hoping that it would get fixed. You have no reason to buy this. If you liked Destiny 2 and, you know, and everything that it had, and you wanted more of Destiny 2, you will find that Curse of Osiris is, you know, a great expansion for you. There's stuff to do, activities, as long as you're not a terribly invested player where you want to keep coming back into the world. I feel like Curse of Osiris is going to be a fine investment for your time and for your money. However, if you are a returning player who has been waiting for Destiny to maybe become a legend, so we'll, we'll use that word. If if we've been waiting for De- if we have been waiting for Destiny to get to the point that we always thought it would be, this isn't it. And the unfortunate thing is, I knew that from the start. I knew that there was no way they were going to be able to fix this or fix Destiny Two with Curse of Osiris. It's just not feasible in terms of developing, uh, you know, the rest of the the Curse of Osiris DLC, Destiny, uh, and then the DLC Two that's coming out, you know, and then whatever the hell else they're probably working on at the studio there. Um, th- that time frame just wasn't going to be possible. So it's kind of like, hey, Patrick, I knew you were going to probably be disappointed, but here we are. <sighs> And I'm sitting here drinking my coffee at 5 a.m. or something like that. So thank you all for listening to my like 30 minutes of ranting about Curse of Osiris. Um, God, I hope I have enough background footage to go for all of this. Thank you all for tuning in. And I'm going to go start reviewing weapons now. Later.